my name is Michael Lambert. I am the uh, National Sales Director here at Lamb Insurance Services. Um, and as many of you know, we've got, a, we've got a host of clients that are on the call with us today. Uh, and we've also got uh, other people that are new to us. So uh, we at LAM, we're the largest broker in the country that's dedicated exclusively to ensuring nonprofit and human service organizations. Uh, since our inception roughly 15 years ago, um, we've exclusively for, focused on human service. And uh, one of the first and largest groups of clients are religious organizations. Today, we insure thousands of churches across the United States, and the firm was founded on the belief and the ability that as a niche player, we will get the best coverage at the lowest price for our clients. So um, our mission, which remains to this day, is to protect organizations that positively affect people's lives. And I hope that everybody is gonna get value out of the discussion that we have today. Um, before, uh, here's the agenda that we have today. I uh, just gave a little bit of intro of, of LAM and who we are. I'm gonna give a quick update on the hard market. Then I'm going to pass it off to our, for our panel discussion. Uh, before I jump into the hard market, I just wanted to give a really, really brief introduction to our panelists and uh, they'll get into more detail about their background. But we have, our moderator is gonna be Matt Basile. He's with us here at LAM Insurance. Um, we also have Eric's, Eric Walseth, who is an underwriter at Convello Insurance. Uh, Eric is, brings a wealth of knowledge. He's been an underwriter specifically focused in the religious organization space for over 20 years. So really excited to have him here. And also um, equally as excited to have Gene Dennis, who is not only is he a religious leader, uh, but he's also worked in the insurance industry for over 40 years. So uh, what better person to have here, somebody that's involved, um, he's a pastor in his religious organization. And uh, in addition to that, he's also in the insurance industry. So uh, he'll be a great bridge and, and I look forward to uh, hearing his insights. Uh, so with that, um, let's jump into a little bit of a quick market update. So today we are in what's called a hard market. So a hard market, is a period when insurance carriers raise their rates while simultaneously restricting or reducing the amount of coverage that they were previously willing to offer. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very tough time uh, to buy insurance, as I'm sure many of the people on the call here today um, you may be experiencing. So it's really prim primarily driven by a, a couple factors. And I'm gonna try to, to segment the factors into focusing on the property market and then focusing on the casualty market. So let's start with the property market. So the property market, this is going to be focused on the physical structures that you own or are responsible for insuring. So if you have a church or a synagogue or, or a mosque, the physical building that you own or are responsible to insure. So a, a couple of the, the items that are driving the hard market is the increased cost of construction, which is happening nationally. So there's been a significant amount of inflation. So the, the ability to rebuild your church or, or your building, um, it has gotten significantly more expensive, which has driven the cost to insure those properties up. Um, in addition, and, and probably most important, is what we are seeing in terms of catastrophic claims. And those catastrophic claims are largely driven by what's happening in the environment. So we have a much higher frequency of weather patterns, whether it's convective storms, hurricanes. Um, there's also catastrophic claims coming from wildfires. Sometimes those wildfires are, are from lightning, um, but those types of, the claims that are coming from those types of events are causing significant losses for carriers, which is causing them to increase their rates. Let's. Let's move, uh, let's move on to the casualty side of the market. So when I use the word casualty, I'm referring to liability claims. So slips and falls, um, other types of liability claims that happen in, um, usually it's, it's bodily injury to third party and property damage to third party. So some of the biggest factors that are impacting the casualty market are changes to statutes and specifically, specifically around uh, child protection laws. That's happened in many different states across the country. 
Um, removals of statutes of limitations, whether it's uh, abuse or other types of, of situations. And probably the most important um, is something called social inflation. Uh, and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail, but one of, one of the impacts is we have sympathetic juries uh, that are uh, awarding more and more um, in terms of claim payout than they ever have historically. Um, in the industry, the term social inflation is also used, often used, and that is um, related to the concept that a claim that previously happened, uh, let's say 10 years ago, um, has far exceeded the regular rate of inflation in terms of payout today. So I, I use this slide as an example of that. What we're looking at here is a slide that shows claim activity from 2012 out to 2021. And this is specifically focused on commercial auto. And what we see is that in 2012, that one point, there was roughly $1.4 billion in claim activity. Um, and that same claim activity would roughly be of over $4 billion today. So we've had a 300, almost a three, three X increase over that 10 year period. Uh, that's just a, a, a small indicator of what we're seeing from a social inflation perspective. Now, the other thing that's impacting insurance carriers and largely impacting their profitability, which um, when they are not able to run their business profitably, they look to raise rates and they look to limit coverage. So one of the things that um, really was an astounding fact that I, uh, that I came across was the number of nuclear verdicts. So when we look and think about nuclear verdicts, a nuclear verdict is defined as a individual claim where the payout was in excess of $5 million. So when we look back to 2020, the total incurred of nuclear verdicts across the industry was roughly $5 billion. Um, fast forward two years, and that went from $5 billion to $19 billion. So the amount of claim activity that insurance carriers have been experiencing is up dramatically, which has caused those carriers to limit coverage and increase rates. The last part of, of the explanation that I'd like to get into is to show uh, from looking at it from a visual perspective, how has the change in losses and claims, social inflation and nuclear verdicts, how has that impacted a carrier's profitability? So. Uh, what I want to bring everybody's attention to is um, every when a carrier takes in a dollar of premium, there is a his, there was a historical amount of uh, cost and payout that the carrier expected to have um, and left some money over for profitability. So this 85% combined ratio, um, and a combined ratio, simply put, is the amount of um, premium dollars that a carrier has received and how much they've paid out. So typically the combined ratio is made up of overhead. So that's the cost of the carrier to do business, for them to rent their offices, pay employees, the technology, et cetera. Typically that's 35% of their cost. Then a carrier would expect to play, pay out 50% of that dollar they received in claims, leaving roughly a 15% profit. Um, now let's fast forward to what's happening in today's day and age with social inflation, et cetera. So with social inflation and rising carrier costs, you'll note that um, I actually kept the overhead the same at 35%. But when we see social inflation and significant increase in claims, that entire dollar gets eaten up. So what is a carrier's response to that? A carrier's response to that is that they are going to charge a greater amount to build back in that profitability to their business model. So that carrier that was pre previously charging as a dollar now needs to charge a dollar fifty to get back to the same level of profitability. One other thing to note is you'll also see that just like I'm sure all of us have experienced in our in our regular lives, we go to the supermarket, we go to the store, we need to buy you know, materials, clothing, what have you, the cost of goods have gone up. So the cost of the overhead for an insurance carrier has gone up, which has um, continued to impact their profitability. So 
we see that dollar fifty is now what it cost when previously the carrier was profitable at a dollar. So um, with that, um, I'd like to to pause. Um, this is a really quick rundown of what we're seeing in the hard market, and I'm going to pass pass it over to Matt Basile, the moderator for our panel discussion, to get into some Q and A and I think you're going to hear some of the concepts that I discussed within the panel discussion. So, Matt, please take it away. Sure thing, Mike. Thanks so much for uh, giving us the rundown on what's going on in the hard market. Um, just wanted to go ahead and introduce myself real quick. My name is Matt. Like Michael said, I'm a senior client executive here at Lamb Insurance. I've been here for about three years. Uh, like Mike said, Lamb Insurance is a uh, brokerage. We work exclusively in the nonprofit and the human services world. A huge portion of our clients are in the faith-based world specifically. Uh, one of the reasons I chose uh, to work for LAM was because it's a people-first people first organization, right? And what I mean by that is like our mission, right? We're protecting organizations that positively affect people's lives. Um, the way I like to sum it up is people helping people, right? So um, I grew up in the missions field. My parents uh, worked and they planted schools, they started churches, they drilled wells, they worked with orphanages all abroad. Um, and so that left an impact on me. And so when I came to the States, when I started working uh, professionally, my goal was to join an organization that was a people first organization, right? So I came to LAM thinking, this is gonna be great. I'm gonna work with clients that are helping people. Uh, what I was pleasantly surprised by was I joined a team of people that are also helping people, right? So I've got great clients, I've got great co colleagues, one of those colleagues uh, is uh, Pastor Gene Dennis, right? So Pastor Gene Dennis here uh, is a 43-year insurance veteran. Um, and when I say insurance veteran, he's seen every aspect of the insurance world. He was an insurance adjuster. He was on the claim side. Uh, he owned his own agency for about 30 years. Um, and then on the, uh, you know, in his title, right, he's a pastor. So he's been an ordained pastor um, in the Baptist denomination for about 29 years. Um, so when I say he's the perfect person to talk about the faith-based world and the insurance world, um, that's him. On the other side, we've got Eric Walseth. Uh, he's also a teammate of mine um, at a different sister company. It's Convell Insurance Group. Um, and what he's been doing is uh, for the past 20 years, he's been working specifically in the insurance world, creating the policies that you see, right? So he puts together the property and the casualty side uh, for, our, uh, for our insurance. Um, so... That being said, that's a little bit of the intros. Uh, Pastor Gene, can you give us a little bit more about your background and uh, maybe maybe talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing with different churches and different religious organizations? Thank you very much, Matt. Yes, um, I have been in the insurance industry for in excess of 43 years. I started off as an insurance adjuster, was promoted later as a supervisor, claims manager. When I got out of insurance, I was the vice president of claims and uh, decided to get into the agency. And the reason I did that is on the claim side, I was constantly fighting with people or dealing with people that were upset or already had a problem with their insurance. So by getting on the agency side, I felt I could be more of a help to people to make sure they got the right coverages, the right policy and knew what they had and could also assist them when they had a problem. So I've been in the industry for 43 years. I have been a pastor over 29 years and so i understand religious organizations i understand the hierarchy of it and i learned insurance from the claim side so i saw it i had to know all the coverages uh from the claims end so i understand the coverages i understand what happens when you have a claim and i understand what you need when you have insurance to make insurance work for you so i i love insurance but i care about uh my people uh, being on the religious side, I've worked and in, in insured a lot of churches, a lot of religious organizations. And uh, when I moved to LAM almost four years ago, uh, that is their forte and we care. We, we, we want to make sure you have what you have. We look at your policy, we review it, and we put everything together just that we know our clients are properly covered. Thank you, man. Thanks so much, Pastor Gene. Eric, could you go ahead and just give us a little bit more about your background and um, how you came to LAM, what you did prior to that, and what is it that you do on a daily basis? Sure. sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, if you don't count the, the summers in junior high and senior high when I spent uh, the working in my father's 
filing room of his insurance agency. My official insurance career started in 2001. I joined a company called Church Underwriters as a new business underwriter. And at Church Underwriters, we had regional and national programs for religious organizations, uh, faith-based nonprofits, as well as faith-based schools. Uh, fast forward to 2022, uh, Church Underwriters, we joined with Convalo Insurance Group, which, as you indicated, is a sister company to LAM. Um, and at Convalo, I serve as the managing director for religious institutions. Um, at Convalo, we've got a, a new religious insurance program we're rolling out here in the coming weeks, and we're very excited about it. And there'll be more details in the weeks to follow. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Really excited to hear about that as it rolls out. Um, so today, basically, we want to go ahead and hit three different parts. We want to talk about pricing. We want to talk about the liability portion of coverage. And we also want to talk about property as well. Um, pastor Gene, when uh, you're meeting with a pastor or a leader of a religious organization, uh, what, what's some of the feedback that you've been getting when, when you talk to them and you know, when you crack open an insurance policy with them and talk to them about what they currently have? When I meet with a new pastor, one of the first things or a religious leader, they let me know, first, they're concerned about their price. Everyone's concerned about the price because pricing is going up. Uh, but one of the big items that they bring to my attention is they're concerned about their liability coverage. They're concerned about if someone slip and fall on their premises, if someone gets hurt or someone passes out, you know, them getting sued. They want to make sure they have the right coverages. They want to make sure they have the right limits. Uh, they are very concerned about their property. They want to make sure they have the right limits that if their uh, religious organization building burns to the ground, do they have enough coverage to rebuild it? So these are, are their concerns. Uh, some of them are concerned that they have coverages for the items inside of the religious organization. So they have a lot of concerns about the liability, a lot of concerns about the property. Uh, and some uh, have actually talked to me in regard to the uh, coverage that a lot of people haven't thought about, cyber insurance. So that's some of the things that come up, but always pr price is on the top of the list. Yeah, I've when I've had a conversation with a religious leader, oftentimes pricing is one of the first things, right? Because it's the first pain point that they see. Um, and, and, you know, the word stewardship comes to mind often when I'm speaking with these folks and they say, well, what can I do to reduce my rates? Should I should I lower my limits? Should I, you know, maybe increase my deductibles? What would you what would you encourage them when they're saying, hey, the price the pricing hurts? Maybe how can we help that? How can we soften the blow? Um, what do you say to that? Well, I'm glad you use that term stewardship. That's one of the key items any and all re religious leaders think about. And when they ask, how do I reduce my premium? And you're right, the question has come up, should I lower my limits? Should I lower my values? And I try my best to discourage that because you don't want to lower your limits or your values and have a claim and you don't have coverage. But there are other ways that we can lower our limits and lower our premiums. And uh, one, uh, you can increase your deductible. So some religious organizations have a $100 deductible. Well, I wouldn't want anyone to report a claim that's probably under $1,000. So you should have at least a thousand dollar, twenty five hundred dollar deductible. By low, raising your deductible, you can also lower your premium. Also, there are things we can do that will be more appealing to the insurance industry that can cut your costs. One is maintain your property, uh, keep it up, well maintained, keep it painted. Go through your property. If you see a handrail on a staircase that's shaking loose, you know, fix that because that's a hazard. Uh, you see cords running across the floor from the musician or from the microphone. You know, those cords should be moved into the corners, taped down to prevent slip and falls. There are things we can do. Uh, even when the weather is very, very cold and no one is at the organization, at the building, turn the water off, prevent freezing and prevent, you know, the, the leakage. So there's a lot we can do that will mitigate the damages, uh, but make your buildings look more presentable, that they've been properly maintained, and carriers are more favorable about those, and therefore, they can give you a much lower rate. But if it looks run down, it looks like it's not being maintained, you're a claim looking for a place to happen, and that's not good. So thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we you said stewardship, I said stewardship. Um, along the lines of just like stewarding your money well, you also want to go ahead and take care of what 
your property and just making sure that it's safe for any anybody coming onto your premises as well. Um, Eric, quick question for you. Um, from an underwriter's perspective, what changes have you seen in the past five years specific to the religious organization? Mike already talked a little bit about the hard market. Maybe you can say, you know, just key it in specifically to the religious world. Sure. Um, you know, as you said, Mike touched on the hard market and, and provided an explanation for why we're seeing pricing on the rise. But you'll also see during a hard market, uh, insurance carriers tighten up the terms and conditions on the policy. You'll start seeing them raise deductibles. You'll start seeing separate deductibles for things like wind and hail and water. Uh, you'll start seeing them add exclusions to the policy that might not have been on there otherwise, just in an order to in order to mitigate the portion of the dollar that is going towards the claims. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about like the wind and hail like deductibles that people have been saying? It went from it used to be a dollar sign now it's a percentage sign. Why can you talk about why that change has happened lately? Well, it's happening because carriers are trying to mitigate their exposure. So you're going from a thousand dollar flat deductible on your pro on, on your property, and so you might see a one percent wind hail deductible. If you've got a one million dollar building, suddenly your 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 deductible specifically pertaining to wind and hail has gone from a thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars. So it's more of a risk sharing where the carrier is passing more of that exposure along to the insured. Yep, absolutely. Is um, is this something that everybody across the state should be worried about, or is it uh, like more locational, or is it specific carriers, or how are you seeing this in the industry? I'm seeing it across the board. Um, you know, we've always seen wind hail deductibles in coastal areas, but now we're starting to see it in in the upper Midwest as well. Okay. Well, thanks. That's a, that's something that we should uh, definitely be looking uh, out for. Uh, speaking of looking out, um, one of the things I noticed, Pastor, Pastor Gene, when I'm looking through a policy, oftentimes I see a sublimit, and it's, uh, the first sublimit that I always look for is going to be abuse and molestation. Can, uh, can you maybe talk about why why we want to look out for sublimits, maybe want to avoid them at, at all costs, and then um, why abuse and molestation is so important to have um, you know, the full limits of? Thank you very much. Many religious organizations have not realized the severity of abuse and molestation. And they haven't realized that that's a coverage they should have. And if they have it, they think it's nominal, minute, therefore give me some lower limits. However, we no one ever expects that there will be a claim of abuse and molestation in their congregation or in their organization. However, there are things we, we try to tell them to do. One, in any classrooms where children are kept, there should always be glass doors so you can see what's going on. There should always be monitors walking around checking to make sure everything is going uh, according to the business plan. Uh, but your limits, once a claim occurs, because that's my background, a claim, once a claim occurs, some lawyer is going to get a hold to it and all of a sudden blow it out of proportion. And therefore, if you've got $100,000 limits, $500,000 limits, they're going to go and shoot right past your limits looking for money. And therefore, so we try to make sure all of our related organizations make sure that they have a minimum of a million dollar limits, million, three million, uh, sometimes more. I have some that have actually purchased umbrellas, which is great. And then when we talk about that, if you don't mind, Matt, uh, sure. then there's another one with the... Uh, abuse and molestation comes in with the directors of officers. And when we're talking about limits, no religious organization should ever be without the DNO or directors and officers coverage, because if there is a claim, if there is a lawsuit that comes to that organization, uh, they're going to list and sue some of everybody, the directors, the, the, the leaders, the, the elders, bishops, pastors. And if the limits are low, they can then go after you personally. And that's why you don't want someone to come after you personally when you're just on the board of directors for an organization or you're just a leader, but you, you're not controlling. But having the proper limits of directors and officers uh, will protect the leaders in these organizations. And you never think that anyone will cause an abuse or molestation, but you don't know. And it's always better to be safe than sorry.
I completely agree. I actually, we have a teammate, Liam, on our team where he said the very first line of coverage that anybody looking to start an organization in the nonprofit or the social services world, uh, faith-based world, should look at, the very first should be directors and officers, right? Why? Because it's going to cover you, it's going to cover your personal assets, it's going to cover your board members and any leadership on your team. Um, and it's, it's crucial to go, go ahead and cover them. Um, and it's just as important as covering, you know, professional liability, general liability, um, any buildings. Uh, so, yeah, thanks so much for mentioning that. That is very crucial and uh, key coverage. Um, Eric, uh, we just talked sublimits a little bit. We talked uh, specialty coverages. What is what, what are some uh, exclusions that maybe um, an insured should look for, a broker should look for in an in, in insurance policy specific to the religious world? Sure. Um... The first thing to look for is that your basic insurance form is going to have an exclusion for sexual sexual abuse coverage. So you want to make sure that you have an actual sexual abuse endorsement on your policy. It's not something that's going to be covered silently. I mean, you want to make sure you actually have a, an endorsement with limits on the policy. Uh, if you have employees, EPLI, excuse me, employment practices liability is also something that's excluded under the base coverage form. Um, Carriers are adding water exclusions. We talked about wind hail deductibles. We're seeing wind hail exclusions in some areas. Um, I haven't seen it much in the religious sector yet, but in other areas, we're starting to see and hear rumblings of sidewalk exclusions, which concerns me, especially for uh, religious organizations and anyone that's in the business of public assembly. And with the sidewalk exclusion, what that means is that if someone were to slip and fall and hurt themselves on the sidewalk outside of your outside of your building, that wouldn't be covered. Yeah, that's uh, definitely one of the exclusions you want to look out for. I've seen, I think I've seen it one time. It was, um, I would say, a table pounding uh, moment where I said, "Hey, like, if you don't do anything else, this needs to be taken care of immediately, right?" Um, and I would say that the same thing for anything abuse and molestation exclusion. Um, one of the things I get asked often when I'm talking with a pastor, Eric, is I get asked, "Hey, look, we're preaching from some things that may be culturally sensitive." Um, what if I say something that, you know, agrees with my religious text, but doesn't agree with, uh, somebody that's in, in the poll in, you know, in the seats, um, is there maybe like a religious expression? How would that be covered? And, um, what should they look for to see if they do have that kind of coverage? You definitely need to refer to your insurance policy. Um, some carriers are silent on it, uh, which means that they don't specifically exclude it, but it's not specifically spelled out as a covered uh, coverage either. Uh, it's not a great situation to be in if there's a lawsuit. Um, starting four or five years ago when we started to see the legislation and or legalization of same gender marriage, uh, we started to see churches being sued for refusal to perform a same sex marriage. Um, and at that time, some of the major church writers uh, saw the gap and they uh, created endorsements to cover uh, like you said, uh, religious beliefs. Um, they might, it might be called religious expression coverage, religious communication coverage, religious freedom coverage. Those are the three common that I usually see a list as, but you want to make sure that you have those available. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. Uh, Pastor Gene, I got another question for you. You already mentioned a little bit on the property side, said, you know, making sure um, everything's in order as far as making sure you know, there's no cords on the ground or um, you know shaky shaky handrails but um, how do you how do you address you know sacred text or stained glass windows or organs and instruments uh, when you're walking through a church uh, or a different religious organization well thank you for asking that's a great question and most of the time when I try to ensure a religious organization I try to go see it personally and when you're walking through it and you see that they have stained glass windows you make a special note of that. You see they've got a very expensive organ. You make a note of that. If they have a room or something where they have their sacred text that the church has been storing for hundreds of years, this needs to be noted and added to the policy. Most of the time, they don't have coverage for their sacred text, or they may not have proper coverage for the stained glass windows. And you must understand the stained glass windows most of the time has been put in there maybe 100 years ago because this sacred building has been around for years. It's not easily replaced. It's not easily found. It may have to be fabricated. 
and you need to make sure that your policy allows you or gives you the necessary coverage and limits for that. And you in, you build that into your policy. These are the things we at LAM bring to the attention of our religious organization because see, we care. You know, most agents, I wanna sell you a policy. They wanna make sure you write a policy. If you have what you need, fine. If you don't, fine. We got paid. We at LAM, we're not that way. We have clients that we care about. We have clients that are in a special group that we find, I would like to use the word sacred, that they're special, they're religious organizations, they're, they're stewards of God's property. And we want to make sure that if anything happened to it, it can be replaced, it can be covered, it can be taken care of. Those stained glass windows will be replaced in the best manner that they can. If something happened to sacred text, they will be comp properly compensated for it. Uh, because a lot of the sacred text, you can't just duplicate and, and go have it remade. Uh, and uh, and find ways to protect it, like store it in fireproof cabinets and things like that. So these are the things we bring to the table when we meet with a religious organization. That's great. Thanks so much, Pastor Gene. Yeah, like I said, it's, we're just people helping people, right? Right. Um, all right, Eric, I had another question for you on the, as a, from a carrier's perspective, what can a church do to go ahead and make themselves as attractive or as marketable as possible on on the property side like what are you as an underwriter looking for when you're re reviewing a submission from from a guy like pastor gene or for myself uh when i'm taking a look at a submission i want to see that the church is being is actively being a good steward of their building uh this means having the building maintained and updated regularly and keeping good documentation um you know, for example, I was looking at an application for church insurance a couple of weeks ago, and there's a spot on the application where it asked for the age of the roof, and it was blank. And so I went back to the broker on the account and said, you know, when was the roof last replaced? This building is 60 years old. And he went to the church and came back and said, they don't know. And at the end of the day, we weren't able to provide them with a quote just because they didn't know how old their roof was. So documentation is key in making sure that you're actively maintaining your property. That's great. Yep. Uh, completely agree. I always, I'm like, hey, look, the best thing possible is receipts and documentation, right? So if you've got a spreadsheet and it talks about the maintenance schedule for your organization and for your buildings, great. Share that with me. I'll share it with the carrier. Carriers love that, right? Um, all right. Pastor Gene, we've talked about losses a little bit as well. How do you address a large loss with the insured? And then when you're taking it to a carrier, how do you explain that? Thank you. What happened? Going back for what we where we started, the first thing that most religious organizations are concerned about is price. And once you have a large loss, you automatically assume, understand, or know your premiums will go up. And what we have to do is when we're getting with the client, when we get with the religious organization, to discuss with them what happened how it happened and then we come up with ways and forms that we can prevent it from happening again stating that we're doing everything we can to mitigate our damages you had a massive water leak because the pipe froze but from now on if it's real cold and the weather is be below 32 degrees and no one's at the, at the organization shut the water down cut it off uh um do what you can to protect it in case of that large loss if if a storm came brew a hole in the roof, but you need to get it tarped immediately as quick as possible. And then we can take that to the carrier and let them know that, hey, this happened. However, they took the necessary steps to prevent the loss from getting larger and they're doing everything they can to prevent it from, every, from ever happening again. And these are the things that they're doing. And once you do that, you build a more attractive picture for the client to go to the carrier. They get a better results on their cost on their premiums and they have less chance of having a large loss ever again. And everybody becomes a winner. Absolutely. And Eric, I saw you nodding, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip the question right on over to you. As a carrier post loss, what is it that you're looking for? Are there any steps that they can be that can be taken to go ahead and, you know, make themselves again more attractive to a carrier, but also just go ahead and prevent maybe something happening again in the future? Yeah, Matt, um, documentation and detail is critical. Uh, if, if you've had a claim and I have an application for your insurance, I want to know what happened, why did it happen, 
And what have you done specifically to make sure it's not going to happen again? To use another example, we I was looking at an application for a church and they had their air conditioner vandalized three out of five years for, from copper thieves. And we went back and said, okay, what have you done? Have you installed cameras? Have you installed fencing? No, we haven't made any changes. We just replaced the air conditioning unit. Well, we weren't able to provide them with a quote. So preventative, preventative measures, we really want to know why it's not going to happen again. Absolutely. I ha we have a teammate here, another teammate, right? Brian, keep talking about our teammates, just people helping people. But um, he always says, help me help you, right? What happened, just like you said, and how is it never going to happen again, right? What are the action, actionable steps that you guys have taken to make sure that we can go ahead and prevent it going forward? Um, and again, documentation is key when it comes to something like that. Um, <clears throat> Pastor Gene, you talked a little bit about DNO, so I want to go ahead and hop on over to Eric. Um, we've talked about, you know, our professional liabilities, our cyber, li uh, sorry, our professional liabilities and our buildings, property liabilities. Um, could you talk a little bit about cyber liability? That's, a, that's newer coverage that we were seeing. Um, I think it's a little bit more important now and it's getting more and more important as uh, time goes on. But can you maybe explain why it's uh, important specific to, you know, smaller organizations or religious organizations? Sure. It is very important for religious organizations now, especially with the advent of online tithing and other forms of donations. Uh, you're collecting and you're storing personal identifying information of your congregants. You have a duty and an obligation to protect that data, but that's not always possible. Um, you have data breaches, uh, ransomware attacks, uh, extortion attacks. Um, if you are, if, if you're congregants data is leaked you are financially responsible for any damage that they that they may occur and that's where cyber liability may protect you in terms of restoring them that makes a lot of sense um thank you for sharing uh pastor gene do you want to share a little bit about um when you're talking to a pastor do you, how do you bring up cyber to them because I, i'm sure they're gonna, again premium focused and they want to go ahead and be good stewards I just say, hey, I got this new coverage. I think it's important. How, how would you address that? Most smaller churches, smaller, smaller religious organizations that I've met with have not even thought about cyber coverage because they feel they'll never come to us. They're going to the big organizations, the big companies, the big businesses. They're never going to touch us. But I have to bring to the attention, when we are bringing you coverages, we're not bringing you something to try to just sell you something or to make money off you. We're trying to make sure you are properly protected in case of a claim. And when we bring up cyber coverage, most religious organizations have someone sitting on a laptop, taking in the money, bringing it in online, sending it to the bank with no firewalls, no protections, no safety. And someone can come in and wipe that organization out with the click of a key. And they don't understand that. So we try to help educate them so they understand you are exposed there is a greater possibility of them hitting you than they'll hit uh, Apple, them help hitting uh, Facebook, but they can hit anyone and they're looking for any weaknesses they can find. You need the cyber coverage. And if you work with LAM, we have a risk management team that could assist you in putting in the protection, letting you know what preventive measures you need to take and helping you understand what a firewall is. We insured a college a few years ago and we could not get them cyber coverage because they had nothing in place. But once our risk management team uh, got involved, gave them what they needed, they hired uh, a, a, a chief, um, in, uh, I guess, computer officer. Uh, and they put in things in place and we were able to get them a quote that blew their mind because they couldn't believe that it wasn't that expensive because they did what we instructed them to do, but it is crucial. Anyone that's handling any finances or any private business or private personal information need to be protected and, and have cyber insurance. That's awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Gene. Uh, I also super appreciate you mentioning our claims team, right? Our claims team is made up of two parts. We've got a risk management team um, and they do exactly what Gene just said, uh, where they will go ahead and help you prevent claims, right? They'll go ahead and connect you with our abuse prevention systems, which have um, just recommendations and policies to go ahead and implement into your employee handbook to go ahead and prevent abuse. 
Uh, they've got background checks. We've got a rule of three where, you know, you never want to have a, a kid in a room alone with the door closed with another adult. Um, and then we also offer a claims advocacy side. And the claims advocacy side, I, I like to think, is our, our secret weapon, right? So if you're going to go ahead and file a claim with your carrier, we've got a professional advocate on your behalf, right? So they'll go ahead and word the claim in the best way possible to make sure it's paid as quickly as possible. And they'll walk you through along every stage of the claim until it's paid and closed out. Um, and once it's closed out, then obviously like Pastor Gene and myself go ahead and step in and we'll go ahead and market out to the carriers for you to make sure you, we keep your premiums low. And you know, the goal, like always, is better price and better coverage. Um, we're gonna go ahead and open up the forum to some questions from the general public. Would love to talk to you. Thanks again so much for um, ch chatting with me, Pastor Gene and Eric. Uh, you guys have been great. Um, we're just going to go ahead and field a couple questions. Uh, you're welcome to go ahead and ask myself, Pastor Gene, Eric, uh, even ask Michael if you guys would like. Thanks so much. All right. Um, I got one here for you, Pastor Gene. Uh, it's what coverages would you recommend for a church? who rents out uh, their space for to non-members, what coverages should they insist on the renters carrying themselves? That's a two-part question, but uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the church needs to make sure that their agent understands that they are renting out property uh, or spaces, so they make sure they have the necessary coverage for that, that it is being used as rental property, so they need special coverage for that. However, that anyone Let's say they're renting it out for a music, musical conference or they're renting it out for a, 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 pa a fashion show. Make sure anyone that comes on the property that's renting it have liability coverage. They should have a minimum of a million dollars of coverage before you allow them on your premises. Because if they did something wrong, injure someone or cause someone to be injured because of their program or what they're doing, the person can come back ultimately and sue the church. And you make sure that you get a certificate of coverage up front and that that certificate is, is dated the date that they will be in your premises. If they're going to be there for any length of time, I highly recommend every month you get an updated certificate because they can buy the insurance just to get on your premises and let it lapse. You make sure that that coverage is still in force because you don't want to be liable for their mistake. So, so what I'm hearing is come one, come all, but come covered, right? <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> sound. Best way to put <laughs> it. That right. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, let's go. We've got another question here for Eric. How does wind-related claims history affect policy renewals? Uh, it really depends on the carrier. Um, you know, they are... You know, wind isn't always something you can you you can prepare for. Um, obviously, if your roof is in better shape than not, you're less likely to sustain wind damage. Uh, one wind claim typically isn't going to have a major impact on your insurance, but if you start having multiple claims for wind and hail, then that's a trend, and then they start expect they expect that there's going to be uh, future occurrences. So. <clears throat> build on that is there anything structurally that they can do to go ahead and potentially you know prepare for wind coverage or maybe lower their premiums that like an insurance broker or, yeah, sorry an insurance carrier would want to see um regular roof so inspections building material okay yep regular roof inspections uh all right got uh here's another another wind and wind and hail uh, coverage. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Pastor Gene. How is our building and property covered in the event of wind damage? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. it says, how is our building and property covered in the event of wind damage? So it's uh, similar, similar, I guess. Go ahead. I'll let you take it away. Right. Well, first of all, you need to make sure that your policy have wind and hail uh, coverage on your policy because it is not an automatic coverage that you will get. So you need to make sure, and especially depending on the part of the United States you are, some places have more wind storms than others, such as the East Coast, we have hurricanes that come certain times of the year, 
some places in central, they have tornado. You need to make sure your policy have that coverage specified and that you have adequate limits on your policy. And also just to go extra, you need to do everything you can to protect your property in case of a storm. Uh, if you need to board up windows and you know a bad storm is coming, you need to do that. You need to make sure doors are shut and locked. You need to do that. You need to do everything you can. And if it does have a claim, do everything you can to mitigate your damages. If a tree is laying on your building, get it off as quickly as possible. Put a tarp on top of the building. So those are the things I think you need to do, but make sure that that coverage or you have it endorsed on your policy. Check that now before the storm. And Matt, if I may, um, sure. we're also starting to see more use of roof limitation forms on coverage, which means that the one option is that your roof might be covered on an ACV basis, which means you're getting actual cash value rather than full replacement costs. So they will take the amount of the claim, subtract the depreciation for the value of the roof, and you're not getting a brand new roof out of it. You're getting a partial payment. The other one is a cosmetic damage exclusion, which we're seeing primarily on metal roofs, but we are seeing it in other types of roofs as well, where what that says, if your roof is damaged by hail, if it's cosmetic only, they're not replacing your roof. You don't have a claim. It's only if the roof is penetrated and no longer is a seal against water, will they cover the claim. So that's just two, yeah, two things you have to look, look for on your policy. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I um, oftentimes people forget what cosmetic damages are. And so it's just like a nice, a nice thing to note and just say, Hey, like maybe we can go ahead and get that removed. And um, because obviously a dinged up roof that nobody wants, but um, definitely something to keep an eye out. Michael, I've got a question for you. Um, is the hard market impacting religious organizations more than the rest of the industries? And also, do you see an end in sight? I'm not sure if the end in sight is the hard market. Um, I, would, yeah, I would imagine it's for the hard market specifically. Um, so thank you for the question, Matt. But I'll start, I'll start with the end. Uh, the, so what, what it appears that we are seeing in certain parts of the market is a is a slowdown of, of the hard market, meaning that uh, the rate of increase that we're seeing from carriers has started to slow down. Um, now, I don't see in, in my crystal ball, in the near term, I don't see a turn um, that quick. Having said that, uh, I'm excited about things like what Convelo is about to come out with in their new religious organization program, because the more that we do, we can see and create competition or capacity in the market, I think that's when we are going to start to see a turn in the market. Um, the, the, the first part of the, uh, of the question, uh, in, is it impacting religious organizations more so? I think what's happened is that there are certain parts of, at least in the human service world, there are certain parts of the industry that have gotten sort of hit first. And I think that the religious organization world um, maybe fared a little bit better in the, call it the 2020, 2021 timeframe, and, and is getting, getting hit very hard right now. Um, that's because there is a lot of disruption in the set of carriers that historically has been interested in writing religious organizations. Um, Part of the reason why, going back to our initial discussion in the cost to replace um, the you know, real estate maintenance, um, replacement cost values. Um, so many of those carriers have been hit particularly hard in terms of their losses. And so the reaction to that, and when I say many of those carriers, I'm referring to the carriers that had significant books covering religious organizations. And the reaction has been to significantly increase rate and really uh, push back on terms that they're giving out. So unfortunately right now is is pretty difficult. Juxtaposed to, you know, at the very early 2019, 2020, when the hard market really started, uh, anything that was call it senior living, that was like the first part of the market that really got hit very hard. Today, it's not that it's an easy part of the market, but the increases and the the pain is 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 a lot less than what it was a few years ago. 
Thanks so much, Michael. Um, I, I noticed that um, I think we've all said the words capacity and concentration. Uh, could you could you just explain what that means from an insurance perspective uh, to somebody who maybe doesn't doesn't know what that means? Sure, I, I'm happy to start off, and then I I would love to kick it over to Eric because he may have yep. uh, some detail to add. Um, so when I when I say the word capacity, um, there is and, and not to get too technical there is carriers buy insurance for themselves. And so the amount of risk that they can take, take on and how much it costs them to ensure that risk, um, that's going to impact how much carriers are willing to insure in, ter in terms of total limit. So carrier XYZ, they may be willing to write $500 million worth of property exposure all across the country. And then Next year, if their insurance rates double, they might say, well, I'm not willing to write $500 million worth of value anymore. Now I'm only going to write $300 million. So that, you know, in that scenario, $200 million of capacity just exited the market. Uh, so that's what I mean in terms of capacity. It's the total amount that carriers are willing to write and the number of carriers that are in the sector willing to write, you know, this religious organizations. Eric, I'll, I'll kick it over to you for anything at, um, addition. No, I think that was a great explanation of capacity. And the other the other issue that we see is concentration, whereas, as you said, you might have a pool of $500 million of capacity, but if you look at your book and find out, you know, 50% of my business is in Texas, so that might be a problem for you. You might be overexposed in one specific geographical area. And so then you're going to start do, taking action to thin out your book in Texas, whether it's wind hail deductibles or just selectively getting off certain accounts that are, have higher uh, property values. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. Um, hey, Pastor Gene, I got one from you, uh, from our friend Paul, it looks like. He said, do you guys find an advantage in splitting up coverage over multiple carriers for larger ministries, larger being defined as one ministry that operates a school, preschool, college, and camps? That is probably my favorite question all day. Um, yes, um, we would prefer to put all the coverages with one carrier, but it is not necessarily or not normal that one carrier will accept all the risk or give you the best rates for that risk. So we sometimes have to place your property over here with XYZ, your liability with ABC and your auto with F, G and H. Uh, so sometimes it, it comes up, whatever is best for the client, whatever can give you the best coverage, the best pricing, that's what we do. So we may not bring everything to you under one, one sealed carrier, but we take it and piece it together. That means we're getting you the best coverage, the best limits and the best price. So in many cases, you have to do that in order to give someone the insurance coverage that they want. Because when someone is in an area where there are a lot of storms, the carrier that would want your liability and your auto may not want your property. So therefore, we have to go find someone else to do that. And sometimes we have to know that up front. And we go out and take care of that for you and bring it to you. So yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I, again, yeah, it does, it does matter, and it is situational, right? I'm recently been working with a church where they had, they had a few claims on the property side, they had a few claims on the auto side, and they had a few directors and officers side, and it's all under one, one carrier, right? And so when I marketed it, I thought, you know, what, let's just split it up, and we'll go ahead and do directors and officers, so that way they don't have to worry about as many claims, and then we'll go ahead and on the auto side, we'll get them in a standalone auto policy, and then. We'll go ahead and combine the property and the rest of the liability side, and, um, and I feel like that's been the best way to go ahead and drive down their cost because they're getting non-renewed and non-renewed and non-renewed until uh, we, you know, split it up and said, "Hey, wait, let's tell a story about how we can go ahead and address this." And it's actually not that bad if you look at it from three different perspectives instead of one umbrella where it's like, "Well, that's a, that's a lot of losses and it's just a lot of small ones." Um, all right, and. Uh, I'll go ahead and just put this one out there for anybody that wants to take it. It says, any advice or outlook regarding automobile, automobiles that we have within our organization? Um, anybody want to go ahead and take that? Yeah, or yeah I can. Pick somebody? Go ahead, Eric. Uh, with religious organizations, you're doing 
a lot of transporting of members of kids. Um, so my advice and based on my experience is that make sure you're maintaining your vehicles, have a vehicle checklist every time you use it, make sure you know who has access to the keys. Um, if you have older drivers, make sure that they're medically safe to be driving a van full of kids, make sure you're getting newer vehicles as the better technology is available. You know, eight, 10 years ago, the big hot button topic was the 15 passenger vans and rollovers uh, with newer vehicles, the specifically the transit style vehicles. A lot of that risk has been removed. Um, so make sure you're upgrading your technology as it comes available as well. Yeah, the, the other thing I like to do uh, just to make you more marketable, I always, I always recommend uh, just to run annual motor vehicle records, right? Accidents happen. People don't like to talk about them. It's good and it's important for the organizations to know who's driving their vehicles and their history uh, when it comes to specific, specific to driving. Um, all right, let me go ahead and see if we got any more questions before we wrap this up. Questions, though. Um, oh, here's, here's another. Oh, we're going right back to the wind related co uh, coverages. Um, do does the policy cover all types of wind events, including tornadoes, hurricanes, and straight line winds? Um, we'll toss this one over to you, to you Eric. Uh, it depends on the coverage. Um, there with there's different types of, of of wind deductibles, wind exclusions. You have you might have a, a standard wind hail deductible, where that's going to apply regardless of the type of wind event. Um, you might have a named storm or a hurricane deductible where it only applies if the National Weather Service has actually de declared it a, a, a tropical storm and given it, a, given it a name. That's why they call it a named storm event. Um, but it really depends on your coverage limit, uh, your coverage type of coverage you have. Awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, Mike, I'm going to go ahead and toss it back to you so you can wrap us up and uh, get going. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I just wanted to share um, some quick contact information. If anybody wanted to reach out to us here at LAM, um, here is our uh, website, phone, uh, email is info at lamis.com. Likewise, if you uh, wanted to, whether it's reach out to Convello, Eric and his team, um, if you wanted to have your broker reach out to Eric and his team, um, you would do it through Convello, um, info at convelloins.com. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining the webinar. Uh, a, a huge and special thank you goes out to our panelists from our panel discussion, Matt, Gene, and Eric. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We will send a follow-up email, which is going to have some valuable handouts for religious organizations, as well as a link to the recording of this presentation. We hope everybody has a great day. God bless and thank you.